So, I don't know what the Lord's going to have me share, honestly. Um, there's, a, there's a lot, I know, on on all of our hearts for sure. I know that over the last year and, and even longer, you know, as the Lord has done many things in our midst through our journey in life and, you know, uh, in a separation from many things of a former life. I had the opportunity with, um, I think you got, well, Justin and Cole were here for a bit, but the Jollies and, and moons and McGee's came over. They had all wanted to come by to celebrate Dan's birthday. So they took some stuff down and it was, we were having like 25 mile an hour winds here. So it was just a, a ridiculous wind beating outside. So they all came up here to have dinner. And uh, I have no idea <laughs> how we got into the discussion. <laughs> How did, I mean, it started something with the picture of California, but I, don't, I think that it was, uh, I think maybe Dan had asked. They're hungry. Uh, he had just asked. Yeah. So tell us about this new property and whatever else, because, you know, they was asking about business things. I think we're, I think our group is quite an enigma to most people around here. Some shy away from that and some just stand back and go, huh? You know, so. <laughs> Uh, but I somehow I was reminded of um, I, I know that I, what was in what stirred in my heart initially was you know these people probably think that I'm just a total fool and glutton for punishment because and, and just a, I have this insatiable appetite for more and uh, I could sense that because you know I have a number of people that ask of me in that way, mm. you know, like, you know, Tim's the land baron of the peninsula and all this kind of stuff. The realtors say that, and, you know, neighbors are always like, what are you doing now? What'd you buy now? Where are you going now? <laughs> yeah. Let's and, see. you know, with most people, I can stay at that level and just say, uh, you know, trying to build something for the kids and, you know, if they have, if they want to do something, then, that's great for them. And if not, then whatever. But, you know, with these folks, they've seen our lives long enough to where I thought, okay, it's, I don't, I don't want them to carry that perception anymore. So <clears throat> I was, I just remember this picture. I don't know if you guys remember, but it was after the Lord had told, spoken to us about the move from Texas to California I don't know who I was talking on the phone with, but that was at a time when we hadn't, I think we had told folks at that point that we were going to move and it was still just quite a stir. Was, there were a lot of stirs back then, but I remember being on the phone and I, I can remember right where I was standing. I was up at, in the, the, the Chacon church building in the foyer where you go in and just as the steps come down, there was a little desk right there. And I was talking on the phone right there, and I had a etch a sketch in front of me. So I just had my phone on and I was talking and whatever. <laughs> and I looked down and there was this perfectly sketched image of California. <laughs> I was wow. like, "What?" And, you know, I took a picture of it. And, you know, that was just the, the one of thousands of little things. You know, I, I had I, my dad in years past, like. Well, tell me, tell me how God speaks to me. You know, you, you say some goofy little thing like, oh, <laughs> yeah. California. Yeah. It's yeah. thing. Yeah. I never put it that one. That's yeah. Crazy. And then everybody's, you know, they hear that and they're like, hmm. it's very interesting. But you're like, no, that's like one in a thousand. Yeah. Like, there's many, many other ways. And it's, it's so constant that you can't get away from it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Anyway, so you guys to do is April. Yeah, the day. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that right? Oh, wow. That's crazy. Just oh, yeah. It's just being reminded of that. Yeah. It was 10 now. years ago, a few days ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. wow. 
that I got on a plane as well, and my two baby girls. Oh, wow. 2011? Mm-hmm. That's 10 years ago. Mm. Oh, wow. I forgot that she flew out. 4 30. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a crossover, brother. Mm. Speaking down. Don't worry about human conditions. And we are we are our own people. <laughs> we can live better our, our spirit, our soul, our heart. Before the Father, before the Lord, before one another. We didn't come here for nothing. God didn't call us so much. Well, it's impossible for man, for us. Oh, God is impossible. He, he said so. Yeah. And I'm telling you, the COVID-19, for example, is was timely designed to have an impact on us, generally, God's people, the world, for sure. Mm-hmm. But, but look, it exposed so much. What truly really matters in life. You look at the from that point of view, you can see the meticulous arrangement for within God for us to be safeguarded and be blessed. Schools are done. Mm-hmm. So we do not never depend on the school system, those things. It's like nothing happened, but <laughs> Do you, I know for the normal parent, but if you transition, if you, you know, still think about the going back to that system, much more look at the political ideology, culture, strife out there. College become battleground for those ideas. So, do you want your children to go to college like such nature? You may think they need to be a scientist neutral, good to be a doctor, but hey, imagine more than the other from a career, imagine the truth, their, their values, their, their family, how they come out of their marriage, how they come out of to be a mother, a father, in those lines. Well, God is saying, all of us, as the parents, we're not impressed with the unsuccessful scientists, right? <laughs> Really care about whether they are good mother or father, or good, good godly man or woman. And then, can, can this can the college system supply them? Do they honor you? Do they honor care about that? So I don't think so. And to my experiences, I rather through all the college years, the knowledge, everything, how you conquer. And I have, um, have, a, have an experience with, with some, someone who know God and walk with God. Fortunately, I did not have it. So, unfortunately. So, anyway, I'm just talking. You know, so, so, what I have in the city of the Spirit of God is upon us. He intended to break through. He intended to sum up the season, close doors. God close the door and let it be closed. Because you don't. Your life you will never have a rest. You can you close it, you know? Mm-hmm. And then he opened the door, step into it. Back force in the threshold, the one I do, you had to step into it. And then the culture belong to you. Then the new reality belong to you. And make sure you close the door behind you when you step into it. Mm. Mm. I don't know what I'm saying. When God said he need business with a serious tune, he said, please say yes. He's not a God negotiable. You know? He's, we often replace that moments of God. He prepared everything we can see. Yes. It's a test. 
it's, it's crossroad. <laughs> he gave you every provision for that word moment for you to answer him. But Shalom Pishanti said, oh, God, God is not like that. He will not test me. <laughs> you put God to the test. And God is not to be put to the test. Temper God. It's a sin to tempt God. So do he see yes is yes to you or no to you? You don't, you don't tempt him. You already know it's supposed to be on your part of yes. So why you tempt God say, oh, it's applied to other people, but it won't apply to me. Good. So God will continue to, to discipline and he will show his discipline through this fear. So this cruel. You know, he will shut him like iron. He will make the ground produce nothing. Everything you learn, you know, the, the, the pocket you learn, the pocket you trip, you, know, so you lose it. Everything you do will, will, will just not work it. On the other side, you think about it, if you, a king, not saying I'm a king, I mean, you're a king, you're not, feel guilty or bad receiving gifts or tribute from others. And your job is not the labor in the field to tell people how to plant their cross. Your job is to tell them how to use the cross, how to maintain the season, how to how to maintain the neighborhood, right? So you have different set of jobs. So that is the difference of priesthood duty or kinship duty than the ones the 12 tribes, and right? The Levites even tribe. So the teach people culture, culture. And when you are father of a culture in your household, it's so easy. Why? Because the children are going to help you. Young, adult, the young children are going to raise up the young ones, the little ones. They can just carry them like this. Because they, they know what to do. They the intuitively know what to do. You don't have the rest with them. You don't need to tell them what to do. This is a flow into what to do. And come on, you know the difference. You try to tell them what to do, explain what to do, or rather just do, do it, children just do it. Because of what? Because I love my mother and father, I respect them. They, they expect me to do these things. I don't know why. I don't need to ask why. And my father don't explain to me. I, I don't want them to explain to me. I don't need to ask my mother or father to, to explain to me. They don't need to explain to me. So do you, do you understand the difference about the wisdom of Zion, some of the Zion as a wisdom grace? The wisdom grace to continue to say, we need that children know why we're doing it. Why are we doing this? That, that the mental or intellectual impartation make the life so difficult and children oftentimes is a different product. Because when you engage that wisdom, they will not engage with a heart of trust, another realm of will just embrace love in your relationship, and they will continue because of always you ask why is because always they have doubts, right? Why is there always doubt? Is another way. Is another way. Is there a better way? Can I do better than my parents? Or have my parents done enough for me? So it's kind of who the parents will strive to say, oh yeah, we've done enough for you. We've done our best for you at least, you know. So um, please appreciate them. Please. <laughs> oh, sorry, we cannot do that for you. So we feel guilty, you know. So that's it. Uh, we expect you to do better. <laughs> no, the, the culture of the kingdom is a very interesting thing. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. You know, if you know that real fatherhood, real motherhood, children, just, they naturally forge. They naturally take the responsibility. They naturally, they, they never troubled. They can handle that go through difficult with you, terrible time, they also know how to success. Especially you know that how to success. Because you're not French, so all the lines, your life on this 
you know, those those things, the external things, you have a natural culture, you have a, you know, ways the interior learn how to handle those things. So you don't have to severely discipline them, tell them how to handle money, how to handle relationship, how to handle this occasion, that occasion. You don't because the awareness in them is there is a an invisible whole flow thing telling them how to be how to how to carry themselves, how to behave themselves. And I'm making sense to you. So yeah. sorry you prayed for us before team. Lord, we thank you for the mystery and order and flow of your creation. Or for how you do manifest those things in physical ways, but for also the ways that are under the surface, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that in every aspect of our lives, that you would show us how to join the flow of your way. God, in every sphere of our being and in every realm of our lives, Lord, let us be looking for those places that are still out of alignment, Lord, where we are still having to strive and try so much. Lord, that we might find your counsel, Lord, in becoming aligned, Lord, in flowing with you and in rejoicing to see everything fall into place. Mm -hmm. Lord, just because that's the way that you created it to be. Not that it's laziness, Lord, because <laughs> it's a different kind of work. We just thank you, Lord, for just your beauty and, and, and your transcending power. And we pray, Lord, that our lives would manifest this truth. Mm -hmm. Back to you, um, talking about how God engaged with you, move from Texas to California. Yeah, I mean, we, we're all familiar with that story. Right? There's, there's, there's some transitions that have taken place in, in all of our lives. You know, Justin and Nicole, you guys are not new to us, but new to a major transition, you know, just you coming out of a job for 20 years and, you know, figuring out <clears throat> how the Lord directs you when you haven't made plans of your own. And we also have all, most of us have gone through a lot of hardship related to, you know, financial provision and, and, placement um, I don't think that there was a place that we moved to outside of Texas that we didn't consider how we would settle there and God just would not allow us to do that um, and you know I kind of wondered what it was like for the Israelites not knowing where they were going and always looking for a settlement and comparing that with what they had before. Abraham as well, you know, calling you to go out of it, to come out of your country and away from your father's house to a place that I'll show you that you don't know yet. And he had a lot to show Abraham before he ever indicated what that place would be. And Abraham didn't even get to be, he didn't get to settle there. It was only a sojourner, uh, as if he was in a foreign land. Mm -hmm. But what he did see was the kingdoms of the world, how they were ruled, how they were led. And that came to a pretty meaningful comparison to him, especially after he and Lot parted. And Lot took the better land. <laughs> And the Lord said, don't worry about that. You know, I'll be, I'll be everything that you need me to be. But he meant, obviously, something more than the provisions of lands. And, of course, Lot was caught up in this war. 
lost everything he had, and Abram went out to rescue him and his family, spare the, the king of Sodom and everyone else and all of everything they had. And he approached Abram with gratefulness and, you know, what he basically said is, whatever you want, what I have is yours. Take. And Abraham, Abram had already seen the, that kingdom, its leadership, its way of life, what led to this war, what brought them to this place of loss. He had also somehow been introduced to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who was not a part of this battle at all, <laughs> who had a whole other way of life and reigned over the city of peace. And when the king of Sodom came to bless Abraham, he said, I want nothing from you. I don't want anything from what you have, from the way you live, so that there can be, there, there can be nothing or anyone that ever says that this way of life became a blessing to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And so instead of receiving from one, he tied them to the other. Mm -hmm. he, he, he gave himself toward the reign of Melchizedek mm -hmm. and received a blessing from God. And so, and this is something that Emmanuel shared recently, some different venues, but in essence, when God saw where Abraham put his practice and, and his commitment, in other words, the expression from Abram was, this is what I want. This is what I want to engage in. This is the kind of rule and, and life and way of life that I will give myself of myself, of what I have to receive. Mm. And so the Lord's response, we know it was all in the same time mm. that God said, okay, then I'll make a covenant with you mm. to accomplish that. Mm. I will make you that people. Mm. And we know that that's the case because of how the apostles looked back on that very instance. You know, Paul said, this is something that really only those who have received revelation and maturity from the spirit can understand because it is moving beyond the work of God in man's flesh into the fulfillment of God's purpose for man's existence. So that moves from the individual life to the corporate plan mm. of God for mankind. Mm. And so he, Paul makes reference to this. And, you know, these folks in the Old Testament, the, the Moses writings and Paul's writings, they don't ever really use the words culture, but they use the descriptor is a way of life. It's all through the book of Acts. Christianity is called the way. What set the people apart wasn't the ichthusis that they drew in the sand and the creeds that they carried against the Judaizers or the Sadducees or the Greeks. We believe this and you believe that. It was a way of life. I mean, the beginning of Acts was very clear. And I don't think that the, the as opposed to what most people believe about the way the church function, we, we should never look at Acts as a model for how to do church. Mm. Acts 2 and 3 are not the model, but they are the, the product mm. of a people who are led by the Spirit. Mm. So when we replicate their fruit, we don't, we're not doing so by the leading of the Spirit. Mm. So the next church plant, this, this time, this time, it's the New Testament church. This time, it's the church of Antioch, because they really had it right. Mm. Well, that's all wrong. Mm. This time, we're going to have apostles because of this. We chose that. This person had this gift and that. Mm. That's not the way it happened. Mm. 
This, this time we're going to be like Jesus. That's not how Jesus was like Jesus. He was what he was and who he was and what he said and what he did because he, his whole life was given over to the will of God. And the people of the early church were a big mess and not really understanding what that culture was like. But they were being governed by another order. And I don't see a whole lot in the scripture that indicates that much of the new church ever came to a place of maturity. You know, in John's letters to the churches, the church in Philadelphia was the only, the only group uh, in essence that had received the direct criticism from the Lord. Mm-hmm. But the letter that the letters of Christ to the churches were all as one mm-hmm. really when they were sent out to the various provinces from John's hand, because they each said, the Spirit is saying this to all the churches. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as I sh- shared some of this with the folks the other night, especially the transition of, you know, wow, we were, we really had a lot of struggles. Mm-hmm. We had a lot of lack and uncertainty and unsettling. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were living in our own homes and other people's homes, and we were getting help from the government. We were not having jobs and having jobs and all these crazy things and not really having any kind of settlement. We had no place to, to call home spiritually. Yeah. I don't know how you guys slept. Yeah. I had a lot with the children. You know, mm-hmm. that's difficult. So, <laughs> no party. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I, it, I guess one of the wives said, oh, wow, that's such a common experience for us. And now, look, God's really given us all some settlement. Mm. And, you know, we're, we're not struggling in that same way. Mm. And that's what's so neat is that we have this commonality and, mm. and that God's taken us out of that time. Mm. And, you know, that was kind of, isn't this a neat fact? And, you know, that's when the Spirit of the Lord really stirred in me. And I think, you know, we need to have some pretty serious consideration about our own lives because we can all be joyful as believers and say, wow, look, we have all this in common. Mm -hmm. Or, wow, look at the place that God has brought us, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and forget that God's, that, that would be very similar to Israel having gone through the wilderness and crossed over the Jordan and coming into the promised land and like, ah, wow, look where God has brought us. Isn't this great? And now we get to do all we want, our own thing. I mean, of course we're going to be led by God. But they forgot why. Israel forgot why. They forgot why, why even after the reign of David who brought peace to the empire or to the kingdom. And they settled with what they had and didn't ever really think of who they were to become. Mm -hmm. And so I told these families, well, you ever ask why? Mm -hmm. Why would God take you from one place to another? Mm -hmm. For yourself? Mm -hmm. So we can have stuff now? Mm -hmm. Hair bills and have the things we like and do? Or is there a greater purpose? Does God have a greater purpose for his people? Well, I believe God has a greater purpose. So, you know, most people will say, oh, yeah, we know God's going to do something. And that's what they, how they responded. Well, we've been waiting. We, we know God's going to do something, but we just don't know what. And we don't know when. And so I said, well, you, you can get up and leave my house at any time you want to, but I know what and I know when. That's a hard thing for people to receive when they've come out of religion and the church and whatever else, because basically you come out with a a vendetta against anyone that would tell you what to do or that anyone really has an idea of what God's doing. And I said that, (laughs) but that was, you know, 
a time to share about the pro- the produce of, of God's culture. You know, I don't know what the response of people's hearts is or was. I know that for some it was, you know, wow, but we still don't know what to do. <laughs> what do we do? And I well, I just told you. We've got to start to build with, with the house of God, the culture of God. You know, what are we what are we gonna to have to pass on our children? And how are how we're, how will our children fulfill and, and practice this culture if we're not participating in it and practicing it ourselves? They won't. It's gonna to have to go beyond an agreement. We can't say well, that sounds good, and it's not enough to believe that it's true. You know, James said, faith without works is dead. It's useless. It has no meaning whatsoever. So, believing something is true and agreeing with it, in the end, literally doesn't matter. Because it never produces fruit. God judges by the fruit that is born. So, you know, we've talked for at least two years about the culture of God's house and how it needs, the foundation for it needs to be laid. Now that may be much like the dispensation of the truth, the sharing of the truth, the planting of that seed or sowing of that seed. But unless it begins to bear fruit in our lives, then it has no benefit to us whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when Emmanuel sent out this email a few weeks ago, I revisited it, uh, it um, just in the last week. And, uh, you know, he mentioned early on that he wanted to address something for the proper time moves away from us. And, you know, God's timing is very specific and meaningful and it can be missed. That's not an unfamiliar experience to God's people. And, you know, as Brother Manuel just mentioned moments ago, you know, there's a reason that God has brought us into the place, the position, the situation, and the scenario that we are in. Some by, you know, as he mentioned, where there, wherever there may be any unwillingness, then, well, God's going to deal with that in a certain way. And something that we've learned from years past is that God's way is like that gentle stream of Shiloh. And he would have his people be able to receive of his gentle way by the nudge of the spirit and through those whom he has given to bring that gentle stream like a nourishing stream but as it was with many of God's people in the past the stream is not just not partaken of or received it's actually dammed up it's resisted and so Ultimately, God has to burst out on a a people. And that's not ever really a a pleasant scene. Interestingly, it's the same water of life, but it's coming in a whole different demeanor. And uh, his timing in that is is very important. He wrote here, it's obvious for all of us that God is doing a new thing in our midst and in his assignment to us. For us locally here as God's people, I believe very firmly that this is a similar work that God is doing among others. It's still unseen yet. This is obviously an unfamiliar path for many of us, spiritual leadership included. I think that's important for you guys to understand when we begin to talk about culture and the activation of this culture and the practice of certain things, we don't see the full picture yet because it's unfamiliar. But I will say this. 
There are things that we know and things that we practice, and we do not ask for any. Uh, there's no hesitation on our part about those things. When we, for instance, say <coughs> that it is our practice as a people of God for the heads of the household to be connected with the leadership within this group, that is not something that we negotiate on whatsoever, as if it's right from God or not. We don't, we don't question that. And it's not because we're trying to set up a, a, a hierarchy or put people as leadership. It's because it is conducive to the order of God's house. And God said, that's the order of my house. And so that's something about the culture of God's house. That's a fundamental foundation for it that we recognize. And we see very clearly, we know all about it. So we have to practice it unforgivingly without any reservation. And from that sense, we hold that standard and we don't lower it. The same thing that our people need to be fully, actively participating in personal discipleship. That's not a, there's no negotiation there. And it's not because we made a rule. It's because it's the way of life that was ordained for God's people so that his way of life and the culture of his house can be established. So we can say, well, we agree, we want to have this culture. We don't really know what it looks like. How's it going to happen? But unless we receive the order in which God would put it in place, we'll never know it, we'll never experience it, we'll never see its fruit. And that goes from the head of the house to the youngest person in the house. How will, the, if the head of the house or the, the, the parents and us who engage, or if the leadership are not engaged in those things, then how will it disseminate to the young person? What will they even observe? What will they see? How will they know what they see? We still think in many ways, well, it's because I'll tell them. No, it's not. Teaching will not matter at that point. Children observe. Children, you guys know, Camden, Camden now, he repeats. Do what I see, I say what I hear. That's what Jesus did, but not because he was an undeveloped infant, but because he saw the value. And so if we as parents, grandparents, if we believe that God has something for his people now, and if we here specifically are set apart to be apostles and apostolic, not an office, a position, but those set apart by God who are sent to fulfill his will. That's apostolic. God set us apart. He said, before we moved out here, you will be a lighthouse. Something the Lord showed me yesterday is that the ships in the sea or the, the airplanes, they don't see the tower. They see the light. God is the light. In the dark, they don't ever see the tower. They only see the light. We are only the conduits, the vessels in which that light is fixed. And if we're not connected to the power source, we have no light to shine. So no one has anything to see. So we look at that in the context of what if, if there is a culture that will become to the world a light and darkness, what are they supposed to see? And we try to imagine that. Family culture and otherwise. And what I recommend is that we be patient with the Lord to see the fundamentals developed because we're not yet fully settled in practicing the fundamentals. We use these words of leadership and order and hierarchy and, and honor and reverence and respect in God's house, and we still almost fully contextualize them with the way that mankind has ruled one another. So we approach it with a, 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 the wrong disposition. We've already imagined it to be something that it's not. 
And Paul and the apostles are very careful in their conveying of this truth to, to, under, to, to, to expose those same kinds of thought patterns when he spoke directly to the leadership in a community, when he spoke to the heads of the households, when he spoke to the children and to the young people. And what was required of God's people. So to say, we are on an unfamiliar path, true. But it doesn't mean that we have not begun to initiate what we have received as something that cannot be compromised. So in that light, it needs to be trusted. It's an entrustment. For us, that entrustment comes as a very sober, heavy burden. But bless the Lord, he says, so this is where that, my thoughts came from. There are some fundamentals and foundational aspects of this particular assignment that have been made clear to us and laid out. We can't have a double mind about it or have any confusion over that. We're not still trying to figure out if that's right or the right way. We know it's the right way. And not just because of a random revelation, but because of the consistency of God's revealing it through dreams and visions and circumstances over years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of time. And the Lord taking us back and saying, no, this way. No, deeper work. No. Further consideration is needed. The primary vision is that the establishment of the genuine apostolic order and genuine discipleship in our midst. No one can see it in us if we're not practicing it, including our own young people. How much less or more those in the world? With that being committed and practiced and established by those who are willing or who volunteer to do it, I want to take just a moment. They will be the ones who flourish in God's family culture. He will give it to them. God is not keen to give this to anyone unless they're in the right place. You want to know why we haven't seen it yet? Well, that's why. In our own midst and in generations past, a, co- a culture of fellowship or royal spiritual sonship or priesthood, though that activated by the sun coming. This in our midst will be as the Garden of Eden and will regenerate a people of understanding and obedience in this bridal company with the enlightenment and blessing of the household culture of God. It's something that will be bestowed upon us, imparted to us. But faith and obedience come first. We mentioned up here this culture of uh, those who are willing to practice it and show reverence and awe and fear to the Lord. I was talking with both Justin and Mindy yesterday about this idea of these three aspects that have some similarities, that being Honor, respect, and reverence. They manifest in different ways in relationships and and communications. But they can be met out in three different ways. And these three different ways all produce different fruit. First, we can demand respect, reverence. We can demand it. As a leader, it can be demanded. As a follower, it can be demanded of us in different ways. But the fruit that that produces is something that is forced. So it's not real fruit. It doesn't come from the heart. It wasn't that person didn't offer themselves for that. Whether or not they obliged it or not, it was pressed upon them. So at best, they do what they're told. But fruit is never born there. Second, which we're all more familiar with and probably 
would be more conducive to is that it can be earned, it can earn respect. We will, as a leader, we may act in such a way so as to earn the, the reverence and respect of others. But the response is still obligatory in the sense that I've done something in a certain way, therefore you should respond in a certain way. You are obliged to do so because, again, we haven't touched the heart of the matter. As parents, we do that to our children. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Had a huge impact on the mental health of the children who grew up. The other side of that, you know, is that... Learn hopes. Right. We, we act in such a way so as to believe in our own minds that we are deserving. Yeah. That's really that. But it's obligatory still. It may not be forced, but you're obliged. to. It's your duty. The third is that it is observed. So when I see that someone shows up from their heart, shows reverence and respect from the inner man, because they see something that it has value to them, therefore they give it what is worthy of it then that's not forced and it it's not given because something was given to it. It's an honoring of what is seen as valuable. I believe that that is, that's how this way that is to be practiced in our midst is to be, first of all, practiced. It's how it will manifest itself. And it's how our young people will take it on as their own. Because we won't teach our children saying, you should. God said. We actually won't have to speak. We honor God. We honor those who belong to God. And we honor those who are sent by God. We don't have to say those words. When we see the value of God's plan and his will, and his way. And when we show the proper honor and respect and reverence for it from our heart, then someone else sees that honoring and they say, I wonder what that is. I wonder why they honor that. I wonder why they show reverence in this way, either to that person or to this way of life or to this way of engagement or making decisions. And it becomes a curiosity a different discovery in the heart and the mind begin to take place. It's never obligatory and it's never forced. It becomes then has the potential to become an outward acting of the will. God's the one who will bring the, the will of any person to the place where it should yield like that. Our first, our responsibility isn't to cause someone to yield. That's forceful. That's obligatory. Our only responsibility is to yield and to show reverence and honor and respect. To regenerate a people of understanding and obedience with the enlightenment and blessing of the household culture of God. As the outflowing of this divine favor or blessing of God will be the embodiment and expression of God's ways, a repentance from earthly wisdom and into God's heavenly wisdom or divine order and his divine nature. That is that we have our natural affections transformed into the fullness of God's divine love. For us, at least the heads of each family here, this calling in practice is more than a teaching or an agreeable understanding. It needs, it is becoming, and needs to become our daily practice an educated passion. In other words, we, we're always willing to learn more about how to put, about what to put in practice. During the meeting this morning, I invite Brother Tim to engage others with a solid conversation on this. That's where I call there. 
Yeah. That's why it's struggle. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. that's a high call. So, but uh, trust the Lord. The Lord is hard on this, the vision on this. Mm -hmm. He has a blessing beyond our wildest imagination when, when we become such people. And a great book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something the Lord really wants us, you know, what, what we are offering to all of our families is, and, and this word has come up recently, we, God has given us, and we are trying to make known the ways that this can be practiced. It, the word that came to Brother Emmanuel yesterday was in, an incubator. We've been given and an incubator is it's an environment in which something can be nurtured to life. We've been given this incubator. And whether or not we will come willingly to say, I want to get in that so that this can be nurtured. I want my children in that so that they can be nurtured. That's where we're at. That's how we practice. We want to know how the culture is going to be. We're, we're unfamiliar with what the culture is going to turn out like in some ways. But God is faithfully revealing. Because, hear me for a second, but the culture is not something that we do. It's like the fruit of a tree. It's produced. That's very purposeful on God's part. He doesn't just say, do this. He says, be planted in this way, receive nutrients in this way, and the fruit will automatically be produced in your life. That's how the culture is going to be produced. Mm. Everybody wants to know, what's the household culture? What do we do? How do we act? What words do I say to Cheryl and to Ben and to, what do I do? I mean, when they come in the door, you know, do I greet them with holy kiss? Do that? <laughs> you know, is that the culture? When someone says, man, I didn't have this. Well, here, let me give you everything. Is that the culture? No, the culture is produced by the practice of a way of life. It will never become a reality otherwise. So we need to get our minds off of what we think that fruit looks like and engage in the practice. Otherwise, we'll never see the fruit. And the world will have nothing to taste, nothing to see, nothing to, to reach out for. God himself, as the master of the garden, will never be able to partake of it himself. He will never come and say, this is the place I want to come and be and dwell because it's pleasing to me. And I receive the fruit that's being produced here. That's all the illustrations of the Old Testament. I plant, I gave the soil, I bought the land, I set up the, the fence and I planted the field and I took out the rocks and I made sure the field was put on the right hillside so the sun should shine on it, and I caused the rain to shine on it, but the fruit never came. Because the people would never be planted. Well, I hope that we will not be in that kind of resisting people and not see the fruit. Because so, we're so concerned about what the grapes are going to be like that we haven't even put our roots in the soil and waited. And that's what God wants us to do. Practice it. Mm -hmm. I've given you small things to do. Why don't you practice? Mm -hmm. Well, most of us, myself included, we will say, well, we can't because. We believe it's true, but we can't because. Whatever the reason is. Or we say, well, what is it again? What's it going to look like? What's it going to be like? What am I supposed to, how am I supposed to do that? It's very simple, actually. Through the fundamentals. The fundamentals. To practice is more than a teaching or an understanding. 